Should I like, hop on his back or something? Oh, definitely. <laughs> 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 He's like, well, I'm pretty in a bond, man. Wait, wait. <laughs> I need to do my hip hip spots today. Right, so I got to stretch a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Just got out of the car, man. I mean, yeah. <laughs> 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 What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Whiskey and Hammock. I'm Eric. And I'm Chris. And we have a special edition today because we have L.C. May from Clyde May's Whiskey. D.L.C. Now, that's the thing. Like, so we reviewed, you know, Clyde May's, you know, uh, like last year. A while year. back, yeah. 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 We both loved it. Oh, yeah. I appreciate it. Thank loved you very it. Yeah. much. It was yeah. very good. So, like, you know, so last time we reviewed the Alabama style yeah, and bottles. we did the bourbon. Mm -hmm. I think we both gave them, like, I think, high, high marks. We yeah. both enjoyed yep. them thoroughly. Alabama Got a little bit of the history, but now we have the Original person. Alabama. Yeah. Grandson, right? Yeah. Grandson. Uh, Claude May II. Yeah. Claude May, that's yeah, it. He, he was Louis Claude May. I'm Louis Claude May. That's how <laughs> freaking cool is that? That's so awesome. Yeah. We got the man, the myth, the legend right here. Right, 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 right. Uh, I don't know. He was the man, myth, and legend. I just speak for him. <laughs> I like so it. He, he did all the hard work. That's so, I, I'm from North Dakota. Okay. It's always grandpa. All right. Alabama's a granddad, granddaddy, uh, grandpa. Uh, we uh, we actually said grand grand. Is grand grand. Say. That's what we would say. Uh, but uh, uh, And then his wife, my grandmother, she was uh, mamma. That's what we would say. Okay. Uh, obviously in the South, you kind of get all kind of <laughs> yes. different stuff. So, uh, But yeah, he was grand grand. So your grandfather was, um, he is the man, the myth, the legend, right? Like he, World War Two. World War Two veteran, uh, fought, um, you know, was with the U.S. Army in the mm -hmm. Southwest Pacific Theater, uh, Purple Heart recipient, Bronze Star recipient. If you're familiar with the movie Hacksaw Ridge, which mm -hmm. is based on the life of Desmond Doss, he and Desmond Doss were in the same infantry together. Really? Yeah, so, uh, obvious, uh, he led a 12-man rifle squad. He was uh, shot in his feet and his ankles. So uh, I guess that's what Forrest Gump would call a million-dollar wound, and he <laughs> right. got to go home. <laughs> yep. Uh, and he... Uh, he was sent to a hospital in San Francisco and recovered from his injuries there for the most part before he actually got to go home to Alabama and uh, got home and you know he married my grandmother shortly before he was sent overseas and they started raising a family and in 1946 he started making moonshine as an extra source of income to help provide for the growing family that he was you know had by the time it was all said and done he had eight children so I had a lot of mouths to feed <laughs> right. uh, but uh, he was never just a moonshiner um, he also had a full-time job um, you know he was always and early part of his life he was in the timber industry he did a lot of farming and stuff like that you know there's kind of this perception that moonshiners only moonshine you know he was doing it as an extra source of income and something he did at night just to kind of uh, help provide for the family and he never sold a legal bottle in his life, you know. I know, I know, I know in today's world, you know, you see things where, you know, people might make moonshine and they go and try to get a license and build a distillery and do all that stuff. Creating a legal brand was not something he thought was ever possible. He lived in a very rural area in southeast Alabama. There were other moonshiners in the area that were all just trying to provide for their family. It never crossed their mind to say, hey, let's start Clyde May's Whiskey. Let's mm -hmm. go to the state, which even if he had, they would have told him no. I mean, it's not <laughs> like he would ever got. But uh, from 1946 until his death in 1990, never sold a legal bottle. In fact, uh, uh, the only time between 46 and 90 that he wasn't making whiskey was when he was in prison for eight months because he had been making whiskey. Right, so. yeah, right, I remember right. that. And then he got out on parole, right? Uh, correct. He sentenced yeah. to two years, got out after eight months. He didn't care what he was doing. It didn't matter if he was, of course, you know, whiskey making is what he's known for. But no matter what he did in his life, he felt that the product you produce or whatever you work on, even if it's, you know, building a fence in the pasture or whatever, uh, your reputation is attached to anything you put effort into. So if he made a batch of whiskey and it didn't meet his standard of excellence or it wasn't as good as a previous batch, in his mind, selling that to someone is like selling them a lie because it didn't meet his standard of excellence. So in his mind, while, yes, he was breaking the law, technically, he wasn't harming anybody and he was right. producing a high-quality product right. that people enjoy. But a majority of his early life was spent actually in the timber industry, mm. logging and things like that. The only reason it's he stopped a, doing that is uh, it's a very tough. And my dad still does it, you know, kind of continuing on doing that. It's a very tough business. One of the most dangerous jobs in the world For is sure. to be a logger. And the only reason he stopped is uh, he actually... 
a lot of people don't know this about Clyde May. He's a cancer survivor. He uh, had throat cancer in the 50s and beat wow. it. Uh, in fact, uh, the doctor that helped him beat cancer, uh, my father is named after that doctor. Oh, no yeah, kidding. So, wow. Uh, but, okay. Uh, he did eventually, you know, recover and overcome that. You know, uh, you know, life in the rural South is about overcoming adversity, and mm-hmm. he sure as hell had to do a lot of that in his life. The Alabama style, I thought was interesting, is like the way he made it. Like, so it was more that the Christmas whiskey was the yeah. So he, what he would do is uh, he was unlike a lot of moonshiners in the area for reasons you uh, just alluded to. He was a believer that I mean, in, in fairness to the other moonshiners in the area. Uh, they were worried, you know, they were like, I got to do this as quickly as possible, make my money, right. not get caught. Right. And right. while I'm not, I would be lying to you if I said that in the back of his mind, he wasn't always worried about the law running oh, over yes. on him. But at the same time, he believed that, you know, since his reputation was attached to it, you got to take your time, do things the right way. But then he also wanted to experiment with different uh, whiskeys or things that he felt would interest his customers or something they'd be interested in and he decided he was going to start aging some of his moonshine into whiskey which was unheard of because you're you know sitting on 53 gallons of evidence I mean, what, I mean, <laughs> right. I mean you're, and you yeah. want to get it in and out uh, exactly. so, and, and he didn't have so he started he knew a gentleman uh, that was able to get him one 53 gallon charred oak barrel at a time he never had like a rick house with like 10 <laughs> barrels you know right. it was done one barrel at a time literally so if you think about it he probably in his life only got to do it you know 14 or 15 times maybe a little more but uh, he would age the moonshine and initially he was not pleased with the finished product because he didn't have the luxury of aging it for as long as we do today he was aging it if he was lucky for about a year Mm. and he had he ran into two problems problem number one the whiskey the barrel had not had time to impart what it needs to do to help not make it so harsh right. so it was kind of a harsh whiskey but in addition to that it didn't have enough time to get this nice pretty charred brown color it was more of a yellow color it was very unappealing looking so he experimented with different finishes to try to solve both those problems help darken the whiskey a little bit and also soften it up a little bit and through a trial and error process he discovered adding a little hint of apple to the barrel at the end of the aging process not for flavor it was more for finish in fact he was not a big believer in flavor because he thought that you can make a bad whiskey and then over flavor it and right. disguise yeah, it the quality uh, but he would put literally just a little handful two handfuls like this of oven dried apple slices and he'd let them sit in the barrel and kind of in part but with it being that small of amount in a 53 gallon barrel it's not like it came out tasting like apple pie right. it just came out he would literally slice apples, put them in the oven, turn on the broiler, which would, you know, get them charred and mm-hmm. brown, and throw sure. those. And uh, and today, we continue that in our original Alabama-style whiskey. When we started as a legal brand, uh, when my uncle Kenny <laughs> May started it, uh, you know, this was the only product we had in our portfolio, which is why we call it our original, and it's also his original recipe. Now, we don't have the same problems he had because we're doing it legally. So we're aging ours. This right here is a blend of four- and five-year-old straight bourbon. And then we add just a touch of apple at the very end of the aging process. We use natural apple extract. We don't use physical slices anymore because for the same reason we don't have those issues. But our goal is for it to not be a flavored whiskey, Mm -hmm. which is why, legally speaking, if we wanted to, we could say straight bourbon finished with a hint of apple or whatever. Mm -hmm, Uh, But we don't want to bring too much attention to that word apple and have people think they're grabbing an apple flavored product. In fact, most people who try this and know nothing about Alabama style whiskey or Clyde May, they have no idea it's finished with a hint of apple and that's by design, you know. Uh, and Alabama style whiskey, I know like with Kentucky bourbon or Tennessee whiskey, those are things that have the state, those states have set forth guidelines that you have to yes, follow to yep. be a Tennessee whiskey yep. or a Kentucky bourbon. In our case, Alabama style is unique to us and that term Alabama style is trademarked to us because it's my grandfather's recipe. That's not to say people can't make Alabama whiskey or can't add a hint of apple, they just can't call it Alabama style. And that, this is the official... <laughs> State Spirit of Alabama. State Spirit of Alabama, right? So in 2004, the state, uh, you know, some guys got together and passed some legislation naming this the official State Spirit of Alabama. 
and the governor at the time, his name was Bob Riley, uh, he didn't like that too much, and he actually <laughs> vetoed the measure. He was uh, the, the bill to keep it the official state spirit. He was like, we got bigger fish to fry in Alabama. We got all these things. We got to work through all these issues, and here you are right. you know, naming an official state spirit. And they actually went and overrode his veto, which was only one of a handful of times in the state's history that – because a governor's veto in general is pretty rare in and of itself. And furthermore, it's even more rare to have a veto <laughs> overridden. Right. And, and, you know, when they when they got the some of these guys that passed it together and they were like, you know, why are you so passionate about keeping this whiskey, the official state spirit? And what I've come to learn is it wasn't so much about the liquid. It was more about the man. They felt Clyde May embodied Alabama, blue mm. collar, hard working. Right. World War II veteran, man of his word, yeah. stuff like that. So when they say the spirit of Alabama, I think they're more so referencing the spirit of Clyde made the man, but also the hard work and effort he put into the product he made as well. And it's remained the official state spirit. Obviously, we definitely have a much cooler, you know, story. And and when it was named the official state spirit, it, uh, you know, caught national headlines and was, you know. Uh, we've we've come a long way though, even since those days. So, so I know yeah. after our after our first review we did with with Clyde May, we uh, had a lot of people at work that watched the the show and everything, and they they went out and bought it, and they're like, "Man, I never, I always just pass it by because it's not, I don't know anything about it." But then you guys talked about it. I have one guy that said he went through three bottles in a weekend. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's a little excessive. <laughs> I said, well, hey, look. Did you, is your, are you still with your wife? Like, what uh, happened? I'm, like, <laughs> I'm not going to discourage him yeah, not to do it. They, just they, yeah, do it there's a bunch of people around yeah. here that know that know about it now, and they love it. That's another thing that I you know, have come to appreciate more and more about Kenny May, my uncle, because he didn't start this whiskey just because of a bourbon boom or because of what you know he was trying to dive into a hot category when he started this in 2001 the bourbon section was a 16th of the size that it is today you know he was just trying to carry on his father's legacy mm -hmm. and uh you know so now to your point you know that we're in the midst of a bourbon boom everybody seems like a new bourbon's coming out every mm -hmm. week and you go to a bourbon uh, selection in a store or even in a bar or whatever, and it's just very, it's overwhelming. You don't know where to begin. Right. So right. our job is, you know, there's a lot of marketing, there's a lot of stories, and it's all cool and fun. But as someone who grew up two houses down in the middle of nowhere in southeast Alabama and can attest, you know, not just Clyde May, but... Uh, all four of his sons, including my own father, have been arrested one time in their life for making, at least one time in their life for making whiskeys illegally. <laughs> so, you know, I've been around it both legally and illegally my entire life. So I can truly attest to what we're doing. But Claude May was doing something special. He truly, you know, uh, the way I like to tell people is he gave a damn. You know, in today's yeah. world, you know, you hear a lot of people say, well, I don't give a damn or whatever. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, Claude May did. And he cared about what he did. Right. And every, like I said, not just with whiskey, but today we kind of romanticize, you know, and talk about his life. But, you know, looking back in terms of what he went through in his life, you know, his uh, never knew his father. His mother died when he was five years old. He was raised by his grandparents during the Great wow. Depression fought in a world war, you know, mm -hmm. came home, raised eight kids in rural southeast Alabama where, you know, nobody cared about that part of the world. And he just, you know, he was the kind of guy that didn't point fingers or blame other people. He said, I can either sit down and, you know, blame everybody else for my problems or I can go out and do something about it and, you know, make a better life for myself. And that's mm -hmm. what he did. Claude May isn't just a name and a whiskey brand. We try to do whatever we can to make Clyde May proud if he were alive today we want him to be able we would want him to be able to look at what we're doing and say hey you're doing you're doing the right thing I love so, that awesome. so much I yeah. love that so much that's amazing all right so which bottle are we going to taste then first? uh yeah we'll try uh, our single barrel so we have a five-year-old this is 102 proof so okay. uh not uh low proof and not necessarily you know super high proof either kind of that uh middle ground it's a uh, non-chill filtered five-year-old single barrel pick you know these uh these single barrels are something we've done around the country where various accounts you know mm. of course hand select a barrel and they get the barrel that they hand select and 
Uh, you can find them in various retailers around Florida and the country. But uh, you know, next year we're actually increasing the age. It'll be a six-year-old single barrel, and obviously every single barrel tastes a little different, which is the whole right, purpose right. and the ambiance right. of the whole thing. Uh, let you serve yourself yeah, thank there you. and uh, help yourself, but. Uh, you know, still though, you have to provide consistency in what you're doing. So we try to do a really good job of giving people the opportunity to pick from a variety. In other words, no matter what barrel they pick, you can't go wrong with it. So, and I think this is a phenomenal uh, barrel pick right here. So, um, uh, and I, so hey, cheers to you. Five guys. year yeah. single barrel. Thank you. Cheers to you as well. Thank cheers. you so much for coming on as well. I appreciate yeah, absolutely. it. Thank you for humbling us with your. <laughs> I don't know about that, you know, it's just, uh... Wow. Yeah, this is a good pick right here, for sure. Mm. There's a sweetness to it. It's... You got, can I have an air freshener? Nah. <laughs> hey, look, that, that's kind of the beauty of bourbon. You know, a lot of times people ask me for tasting notes and stuff, and I'm happy to give them because that's mm -hmm. part of my job. But at the same time, everyone has a different nose, a different palate, and everybody kind mm -hmm. of views and picks up. And also, the notes we pick up in bourbon and whiskey are kind of based on our personal experiences of different profiles and stuff that we've been around you know yep. I've, I've always encouraged people maybe if you don't like something uh that don't mean your friend won't like it because everybody's a little different but oh, sure. we try to be consistent across the board what we do and have a little something that touches all or checks all the boxes you know has a little bit of a spice not too much mm -hmm. uh, little bit of softer notes as well some complexity some layers you know and uh, i think we do a good job it of that. definitely has that baking note that baking spices note to it um, but it's it's subtle. It's just kind of it's. This is super smooth. This is just. Nope. At least I just nice made it easy. You know, but it, I like the fact that it has you know, a little bit of a bite to it. Mm -hmm. It does. So like you, know, almost like you know, the, you know the one video with Dan like you know like you know you drank something. You know, right. Hundred percent. Like, you know, yep. If you want a bottle bad enough, you can probably hunt down a bottle. Is what I'm right. saying. But at the same time, don't expect just to find this anywhere you walk into. But. Uh, it's uh, like I said, we do a really good job of giving. Uh, while you know, what you, if you buy a bottle of this, it might not be the same one that we're tasting right now. Mm -hmm. You know, we do our very best to give people the options to where no matter what they're picking, they're picking a quality barrel and a quality product. Right. Well, I mean, and that's what I think. As we said last time, that uh, like obviously packaging, marketing get you to buy the bottle but you know the juice has got to be good for you to buy another yeah one, right? we're uh, our ceo roy danis who has done a phenomenal job in helping design the packaging and a uh, hundred thousand other things but you know i'm a big believer in that too for what i was uh, saying earlier you know the bourbon section is so big That's now right. that sometimes it's the label the packaging that mm -hmm. might attract someone to buy it 100%, but yep. the liquid inside the bottle is what's got to encourage them to buy no bottles number two three and four you yep. know that's what's got to have them coming back from we'll see life. and that's like you know two uh, Clyde Mays the, you know uh, credit they did the same thing like you know same thing the wife picked it up for me she's like oh I picked you up a bottle because you know, checked the packaging we reviewed it loved it so I've I've, you know, since bought you know more bottles of there. Yeah, I'll yeah. say the same thing I said in the first video. The fact that your wife picks you up bottles of whiskey <laughs> on a whim is you have a winner. Have I say that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Can't go wrong. Lock her down. Yeah, you so. have a winner. Yeah. Mine's always like, is this cop? Is this bottle going to be gone this weekend too? <laughs> well, just buy me more stuff then. There <laughs> There's got to be a happy meeting. Right. Right here, you know, so. So you get what you want, I get what I want, right, everybody exactly, wins. You know? Exactly. <laughs> All right, so now, what's the other one that we're going to taste? So we're going to taste, so this one is something that's a little bit more readily available. It's not a single barrel. This is a semi-new release for, uh, for us, probably going on about two years now that we've had it. It's a six-year-old, small batch, straight bourbon. It's 110 proof. Uh, you know, right now, I know the rage is kind of higher proof bourbons and everything, but like I said, no matter what we produce, we want it to drink uh, less than what it says on the bottle. But when I started in this job six years ago, we had 110 proof, and I would do tastings, and I'd say, hey, here's, we have a 110 proof right here, 
and they would go, oh my God, 110 proof, that's going to put hair on my chest, right? <laughs> and then now here I am six years later, dude, to kind of that high proof fad that we're in the midst of right yep. now. People are like, you don't have anything higher, you don't have higher proof. <laughs> and it's like, man, how, how the times have changed. But this is a phenomenal product. All of our products are award winning. I can go on and on listing this medal or this amount of points with every one of our products. But this one specifically kind of caught fire because... Uh, it won back-to-back double gold at the San Francisco oh, Worldwide wow. Spirits Competition, which is one that uh, is very uh, well-respected and known. And uh, it finished as a top three bourbon in that competition. And once that happened, you know, it got all of the uh, publicity and stuff oh, like yeah. that. That's no. uh, it's yes. something that is. It's uh, I think it's safe for me to say that of all of the new products we've released, you know, since 2001. This is the fastest growing or the best launch of any one product we've ever really? had. It's done very well for us, and it's a great product. It's quickly become one of my favorites as well. You know, um, to talking about your wife and your wife. You know, my deal is like you know, gotta choose which proof bourbon or whiskey I'm drinking around. You know, I can't pound too much <laughs> right. of that. You know, in the house. You know, I have to wait till I'm on the road to start pounding a little bit more. Is this, my special reserve. Is this Kaneka? Yeah, Kaneka. That's correct. So. The original name, when we started this brand, or when I should say when Kenny May started this brand in uh, the early 2000s, one of the things he was concerned with in terms of branding and marketing, uh, he didn't want to just call the brand Clyde May's Whiskey because he didn't want it to seem like he was trying to compete with Jack Daniels, Jim Beam, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So he called it Clyde May's Conecca Ridge Whiskey. And uh, people who are familiar with the state of Alabama, uh, know the word Kaneka because of a popular company called Kaneka Sausage, which yep. is some of the best sausage yep. on planet Earth. I'll say that uh, might be a little, I was <laughs> saying, right. I might be a little biased, but go trace it for <laughs> right. yourself. You don't, you don't get two sixty five without eating Kaneka. And there, you, there you go. <laughs> so, and, um, but where we and a lot of people, so people who see this brand, they say, oh, or is, was Clyde made from Kaneka County because there's a Kaneka County in Alabama, ah, okay. and it's actually no the where it gets the name Kaneka Ridge, so. The town that we're from is called Union Springs, Alabama, and the way it gets that term or that name is there are 27 natural flowing spring heads that meet in that town, and it's wow. some of the purest water um, in the entire uh, state of Alabama. And those it springs form creeks all throughout uh, the county we grew up in is Bullock County, Alabama, and those creeks a lot of them eventually feed into the Kaneka River which is a river that spans eight counties in Alabama. Well, a lot of those creeks flow through our family property, and that was my grandfather's water source for his whiskey. And since those creeks feed into the river, they called the area Kaneka Ridge. Ah, so that's okay. so then when we switched, you know, we never, basically we flip-flopped. We were like, we need to make sure we're putting more Clyde Mays the name, you know, focusing right. on Clyde. So right. now it's Clyde Mays Whiskey, but the name of our distillery will be Conecta Ridge Distillery. So basically. Oh, right, and like you said, you're, you're opening up a new distillery too, right? In uh, Troy, Alabama. So Troy is about, uh, Troy is in Pike County. And when I, so I grew up Ooh. where Clyde May, where Clyde May lived and where I grew up as well. Uh, it's called Rabbit Road, and the reason they call it that is because back when the county wanted to pave the road, or when they wanted people from the county to pave the road back in the 60s and 70s when it was still a dirt road, the county told them, I'm not paving that road, there's nothing on it but damn rabbits. <laughs> so uh, they call it, started calling it Rabbit Road, and it's only about, a, you know, just over a mile long, but on the half, the front half that we lived on, that's Bullock County. And on the second half, that's Pike County, that we lived on the Bullock County, Pike County line. And Pike County okay. is Troy. And that's wow. where we're building a distillery, a $20 million distillery, distillery, Ooh. rick house, bottling facility, museum, wow. gift shop, tasting room. Just like something you'd expect to see on the Bourbon Trail just in southeast Alabama. How long, how long so, of a drive is it from here to Alabama? Troy? I've, Probably from here to Troy, probably yeah, right at no, no, it's not eight at probably about five or six or something. Oh, like really? That. Oh, yeah, it's five not bad. Yeah, if I say, it ta- I, that's not that far. I, well, I'll we put it that. if I say it's uh, <laughs> we drove from Tallahassee this morning and it was a little over two hours or so, yeah. you said, okay. and it took me two hours and 40 minutes to get to Tallahassee. And I live in Troy, so okay. you know, right at five. 
and then you get an hour back so you're driving into central town right, so you right. get an hour back it's, it's a lot quick. closer than the bourbon trail how about i say yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a lot right. closer than kentucky so, so when we come out there you gonna be there and hang out with us hell yeah man you know i'm uh I'm, my goal uh, is to eventually become the master distiller of the distillery. I feel like I'm a, I feel like I'm a phony that my last name is May and I'm not making whiskey of some sort. Everybody else. now I'm trying to break the family tradition of getting arrested. You know, but, uh, at least once. Well, let, right? let's see well, how think, the rest. I think of, you almost have to do it <laughs> once. Though. We'll see how the rest of the how the rest of the day goes. Uh, but. Right. Uh, uh, but we're getting some trouble today, right? <laughs> needless to say, I'll be spending a good amount of time at the distillery. Now I'll still get out and about in the market because I need to get out and kind of spread the gospel of Claude. I want more and more people to right. learn. And that's why I do what I do ultimately. So you said you want to be a master distiller. So I love the part about the beads, the bubbles, oh, yeah, the beads inside the whiskey. So be able to tell what the proof is just by. So that's and it's, <clears throat> it's scary good how accurate. Clyde May was and my father and his brothers. I have some of uh, Kenny and uh, Jack and my other uncle whose name is Charles, but we affectionately call him Spooky, Uncle Spooky. <laughs> uh, they all made whiskey in their life and, you know, they didn't have any kind of machine or device that could say, hey, this is 106 proof, 100 and whatever. So the way they knew proof is they would take a bottle like this and they would shake it up and then they would do what's called, you know, it's bubbles, but they called it studying the beads. And depending on how big the bubbles were and how long they stay there before they pop, that's how they could tell what the proof was. No, and, 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 uh, and um, I mean, I've tested it with my dad where I'll go to a liquor store and find uh, vodka or something with some kind of obscure proof, not nothing like 90 or 100 or something good and even, I'd something like 93, you know, just a random number, yeah. and I'll take the label off and say, <laughs> what's the proof of that right there, and he'll shake it. Now, he does it a couple times, you know, you got to study it a little bit, and I did it one time where it was like 94 or something proof, and he was like uh, somewhere between 91 and 96, somewhere in there. And I mean, he did that solely based off shaking the bottle. In fact, when I graduated college, uh, you know, they my parents asked me. They were like, "Hey, uh, we want to get you something as a congratulations gift for you know finishing school and going to college and everything." And they asked me what I wanted, and I asked my dad to kind of hand draw, you know, how to build a still, how to make whiskey. That way, I could always have that piece of my father in right. his hand notes, no matter. Brilliant. In today's world, especially as the bourbon category has grown, you know, you get kind of a mixture of different people where they're like, well, this bourbon is really good because it's this type of water. Mm -hmm. They'll say, oh, well, this one's really good because it has this type of grain in the mash bill. I prefer blank, blank, blank. There's about a hundred things that affect the flavor profile oh, yeah. of a bourbon. The water, the mash bill, the grains you choose in the mash, the fermentation temperature and length, the mm. yeast strain, yep. the char of the barrel, how long you age it, how often you rotate it, do you lay it down, do you stand it up, what's the size of the barrel. I mean, there's a hundred things that affect the overall flavor profile, but you have to do all of those things correctly in order to make a quality product. So what do you think of this one? Uh, I, it's really solid, good. Right? It's solid. It's you know. Um, I think it, you know, it drinks easy. It reminds me a lot of the bourbon. Just like, you it, know, drink, it, it just has a little bit more of a, a yeah. Punch it's more to bold. It. It's like a little more bold than the bourbon, but it's the same. <clears throat> it feels it like the same. Like you're drinking the bourbon, but it it's just a bold. little more bold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I like that. Yeah, yeah it has yeah. a little bit more bold aspect to it. Yeah, but you no, know, I think that's has a very different uh, profile. I think than you know than the. Single, Single barrel. barrel, yeah. I feel that our rye whiskey is one of the most underrated, not only the most underrated products in our portfolio, but one of the most underrated rye whiskeys in the country. I'll fight tooth and nail on that rye whiskey right okay. there. Okay, so, all right. Uh, uh, and that's another thing about Claude May. Like I said, I could go on for 80 hours about stuff he did, <laughs> but another thing people associate with moonshiners is corn whiskey. They think corn, yeah. corn, 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 corn. Right. My grandfather was a big believer that rye was a flavor grain so he actually mm. would use rye when he a good bit of rye when he was making his moonshine whiskey and in fact when he was arrested in 1972 one of the things that they, and i have his original court transcript i read it all the time i try <laughs> to go a, through there and try to find little things that i was like i wonder if i could get him a pardon somehow you know say <laughs> right. something was up. Yeah. but uh one of the things they used against him during his trial when he was on the stand is you know, they went through his barn after they arrested him, and they found all these 50-pound bags of rye. Mm. 
mm-hmm. and they were like, hey, listen, you know, if you're telling us you're not making whiskey, but if you're not making whiskey, why do you have all this rye grain in your barn? And he said something to the effect of, uh, uh, you know, I'm a farmer. I was going to plant it, whatever, right, but right. he's an eighth grade dropout. He didn't know that rye grows in, you know, North Dakota. And Canada. <laughs> it, doesn't grow, it doesn't grow in Southeast Alabama too well, you know, but uh, he was just trying to beat his charge, and, you right. know, he didn't. He got sentenced to two years and served eight months of the uh, two-year sentence, but um, you know that, and and in fact, uh, you know, just to kind of, I don't mean to get off on a sidetrack here, but uh, with our rye whiskey in particular, if you go into a liquor store today and go to the rye whiskey section, al- almost every rye whiskey has the color green somewhere on the bottle. Right. That's often associated. And don't ask me why I get that question all the time. <laughs> why and, and people try to get so detailed into history. Well, the color green represents blah, blah, blah. Here's what more than likely happened. One brand did it and everybody else started. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, let's just get, you know, let's get real for a second. That is true. Though. Uh, yeah. You yeah. Know, but when we, you know, we like to tell a story with all of our packaging. We don't just want to put something out there just because. And while, yes, the color green, we wanted it to be able to fit in the rice section we didn't want to do it just because everybody else was doing it well sometimes it's better to be lucky than good and when we were researching there because we wanted to tell the story of his arrest on the bottle because of you know the history with the rod and his barn and everything (laughs) in fact the font we use on the bottom half the bottle is the same font from his court transfer oh no kidding (laughs) i love it we discovered kind of through our research that the prison that he served his time in his sentence in at the time he was there the walls were painted half green, half white. No so kidding. we designed the color scheme uh, based off the color scheme of the prison cell walls that he had to look at <laughs> every day. For I months. love that. We want to carry on Claude May's whiskey. We want people to realize that a moonshiner in southeast Alabama was doing something special and then get the credit he deserved while he was alive. Now, you know, they uh, they don't make them like that anymore. You know, best. how about I say it's... Uh, Obviously, I'm biased. Everybody loves their grandfather, their father, and they they think you know that they kind of put the world on their shoulders, and rightfully so. You're supposed to love your grandfather and father, but at the same time, especially in the world we live in, where everybody seems to hate each other over something, you know, Claude May was just a believer, and you know, keeping your nose on the grindstone, you know, keep your nose out of other people's business, mm-hmm. focus on what you do, provide for your family. There's not a you know. In, Claude was a big believer. There's nobody on earth that can change my destiny. Only I can change it. You know, so work hard. Yep. You know, provide for your family, and you know, in his case, make a damn good whiskey. Mm-hmm. So, right. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I hate. Are we gonna drink that one? Yeah, let's do it. We're diving into the rye. Diving into the rye now. Diving yeah. into the rye. So I, it's funny because I, I hike think, it I up think, a little bit. Ooh, it's worth yeah, trying. Yeah. I think there's a, a lot of people. Say, you know. I think there's a lot of people that don't like rye right away. You know, this is a different rye than I've had. Well, it, it starts like a rye and yeah. finishes. Well, I mean, it has the spice. Like like different. Said, you know, right off the nose, I, you know, I did get a little mint. Right off the nose, that's why I, you know. It doesn't finish it, bad different. No. It just finishes different, different. Different, different. Like I said, yeah. you know, just, I'll see the spice to it. I can, you know, there's a little bit of peppercorn. But there's just a little, a little there. A hint of mint. Yeah. Right at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's definitely smooth. It is smooth. It is smooth. It's a solid. It's a solid rye for yeah, it's, sure. Uh, it's it drinks different than other rye that I've had. I, I like really I said, look, I, I'm biased towards all of our products. I'd be mm. lying if I said I wasn't. But I feel of course. that because I, with me eventually wanting to be the master distiller of our, uh, you know, a lot of people assume I only drink Clyde Mays. Well, I drink lots of other products so I can refine my palate course, and know it's right. good. Yeah, and so, the, what's the mash bill on the on the rye then? That's ninety five percent rye, so five percent. Wow, ninety five five. That's a lot. That's yeah. that's different. Well, look at the see, thing look, of whiskey in a hammock. Yeah, yeah. That's, like, kinda, that's kind of how we started. Right. Why we started doing this? Yes. Because like you know we've done reviews where I liked it and you know you did. Right. Yeah. Like you said, the palettes can be different. Absolutely. Said, like, you know, yeah. and, uh, and this was somebody we asked somebody how how do you get a better palette? And he said, taste everything. Taste everything, knows everything. Yep. Yeah. You know. Can you give us price points on this stuff? Yeah. So you know, of course, every state is different. You know, you have open states, control states, stuff like that. But um, you know, 
depending, the Alabama style is one that you're going to see anywhere from 30 bucks to 35 bucks, give or take, depending on the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, our, which is not on the table here, but we have a 92 proof straight bourbon and then our rye. They're normally line priced or very similar price. You might see it anywhere from 36 to 40 bucks. Uh, the single barrel you might see between 49 and 54 you know okay. something like that and these are generally picks for uh, the most generally part. yes for yeah. the most we don't really offer this and just kind of in a you know you either had to pick it or you right. don't you know right. so right. uh and then the small batch the um special reserve as we call it the 110 proof uh you might see that anywhere between 56 and 60 like i said every the state's different stores mm-hmm. work off different margins so i don't like to you know quote just one price sure. but basically every one of these products you should find within a four dollar range of what i just quoted okay so. nice. and this is we can find all these other than the, obviously the single barrel well yeah and like i said if i say you go um all of our products you know um here in florida i know that where you know total wine abc you know some of your major chains like that but also uh local uh uh, privately owned stores okay. yeah. Uh, um, yeah. yeah but uh, it, and also too you can always uh, for people who are listening from that might not be in Florida other places you can go to our website ClydeMaze.com and type in our zip your zip code and it'll show you every not just uh, every liquor store but every bar and restaurant that carries oh, wow. our All right, cool. uh, product uh, close to you so our website also does a great job of kind of you know going through the timeline of Clyde May and uh, you know uh, so you know there's the one negative thing I can say about having the job that I have is that there's no such thing as like a 12 hour podcast where I can tell the whole story <laughs> right? you know, so, well I, so. are you kidding me I you want to do one? I was say, go. I was we'll do part two. It. Part two coming soon. Bring one right? more right. bottle. We can get twelve hours right. into it. Right. Right. Perfect. <laughs> so okay. So, so like you said, you know, you, you can find the stuff locally here, at Total Lines, and you can find it at Middleburg Liquors, mm-hmm. right here in uh, Jacksonville. So, hey, ClydeMay.com. ClydeMays.com. Uh, uh, we have social media. You know, Facebook, Instagram, or of course the two core ones. Mm-hmm. Also Twitter as well. Uh, on Facebook and Instagram, it's at Clyde Mays Whiskey, but our mm, uh, okay. website is ClydeMays.com, and uh, you can, of course, like I said, do the store locator, read more about the history, read more about the products, recipe ideas, things of that nature as well. So. Fantastic. Do you have a, do you have a favorite, we'll, we'll say old fashions because that's what people dig right. right now. Do you have a favorite old fashioned... Well, you know, actually, it's funny because like uh, at the uh, event that we're gonna have, uh-huh. you know, they, they came up with something called the, you know, the Clyde Slide. So it's almost like I signature cocktail. It's gonna be awesome. Yep. Yeah. It's almost like I slid that right in there. You did. Perfect. Hey, look, hey, look. I I leave the mixology to the professional, <laughs> right. not a mixologist. Yep. People come up to me and I say, hey. Tell me about a cocktail, and I say, well, I drink it, and I just need whiskey and a glass. There That's you go. I, but. Uh, these uh, products also make fantastic cocktails. They do. So. I agree. They do. 100%. So, uh, we are Whiskey in a Hammock. Yeah, we are. This is LC. Right? From Clyde Mays Whiskey. This whole thing Thank is you guys Clyde for having me. Oh, yeah. No, future so, yeah. coming out. Right? Yeah. So, Clyde Mays Whiskey.com. Yeah. Uh, whiskey in a Hammock.com. Forward slash store. All for all your whiskey fantastic merch. Whiskey in a Hammock merch. Hats, glasses. Flip flops, t shirts, hoodies. Yes, yes, everything. Hammocks, wow, backpacks. Okay, yeah. The whole the whole nine yards. If you right. want it, we got it, we can give it. If you don't have it, you should get it. Definitely. Because you need it. <laughs> Feel me? Alright. So you leave it the motto? Yeah, hit us. May the window is for your hammock, and your glass never go dry. Cheers, Cheers. y'all. Appreciate Cheers. it. Cheers, thank you. Look at that. Yeah, easy, easy peasy. Much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Easy peasy. Hey, man. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah, I appreciate it. That was awesome. Thank you, guys. That was